What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I think my testicles are dropping! There will be spoilers. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels came out in 1988, and it was directed by Frank Oz. Yes, that Frank Oz. Yoda, Miss Piggy, director of The Dark Crystal, Muppets Take Manhattan, Little Shop of Horrors, What About Bob, and so many more amazing films. Let's start out with the plot. The movie opens up with Lawrence Jameson, played by Michael Caine. He's a suave swindler whose objective is to schmooze little old ladies out of large sums of money. His general MO is to tell women, no, 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 I don't need any money, until they basically force it upon him. But for the children. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Even though he's a scammer, he picks targets that are lousy women, which redeems him a little bit. His latest scam is against Fanny Eubanks, who is as affluent as she is disloyal. He poses as an exiled prince trying to raise money for his country's freedom fighters. Jameson lives in Beaumont-sur-Mer in the French Riviera, and he has amassed a lavish lifestyle through all of his cons. His ruses are so complex that he even has a team helping him along the way, including manservant Arthur, played by Ian McDiarmid, a.k.a. Emperor Palpatine, and Crooked Cop Andre, played by Anton Rogers. He bumps paths with Freddie Benson, played by Steve Martin, a substantially less polished hustler, but a hustler nonetheless, and who is headed straight for Jameson's hometown. Freddie scams on a smaller level and doesn't have the same moral compass as Jameson. Threatened by the possibility that Beaumont or Mayor won't be big enough for the both of them, Jameson tricks Freddie into heading to the next town over by baiting him with a sexy woman, which is just the first time that we're going to see how quick these two can think on their feet. Freddy might be a small fish in a big pond, but he figures out Jameson's ruse pretty quickly. And in response, he shows up in beaumont sur mer ready to swindle. And swindle he does. In response, Jameson gets him thrown in jail for his transgressions. Which is exactly the time in the movie where my eyeballs start burning at the sight of seeing two pinstripe suits. Why? It's also the first time that we get treated to a Steve Martin comedy gag as he struggles to remember Jameson's name. His name is James Josephson. Lord, no, no. James Lawrence. Lawrence! Lawrence! Lawrence... Lawrence Fells. Lawrence Fangs. Forrest Lawrenceton. Jameson helps Freddie get out of jail and simultaneously tricks him into leaving beaumont sur mer Freddie willingly leaves and gets on the first plane out of there. But the whole scheme is up when Freddie meets Fanny on the airplane and she unknowingly reveals that Jameson is a fraud. Freddie returns to Jameson's villa saying that he didn't realize that scamming could be taken this far and that I want this! Oh, this is what I want. Jameson agrees to teach Freddie the art of the high class con, which leads to one of my favorite movie montages. This coaching comes with the caveat that Freddy must do everything Jameson tells him. Now, as a team, the two start hitting marks together using the Ruprecht scam, a fan favorite. The shakedown goes like this. The debonair prince, played by Jameson, has an annoying simpleton brother named Ruprecht, played by Freddy. Freddy, as Ruprecht, is intentionally obnoxious, scaring away the mark, and leaving the two with lots of moolah. Hold up, hold up. We're going to divert from the plot a little bit to talk about this scene because it is so spectacular. But before we do that, there are two other movies that we need to talk about. The OG Dirty Rotten Scoundrels Bedtime Story, which came out in 1964. That's right, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is a remake. Bedtime Story starred Marlon Brando as Freddy and David Niven as Jameson. And the remake of the remake, The Hustle, which came out in 2019. Starring Anne Hathaway as the Jameson type and Rebel Wilson as the Freddy type. All three movies include a Ruprecht scene. But Dirty Rotten Scoundrels outshines the others by a mile. This is because Steve Martin was born to play Ruprecht. His physical comedy, combined with the perfect amount of overacting, makes this sequence unforgettable. In comparison, Brando and Wilson managed to extract a couple of laughs, but it's clear that Brando's strong suit is not comedy, and that Wilson's cheap shots at her own body are stale. Back to the plot. Freddie becomes frustrated that Jameson is controlling him, and the two settle on a bet. They'll pick a mutual mark, and whoever extracts $50,000 out of her first will get the right to stay in beaumont sur mer while the other has to leave. Enter Janet Colgate, played by Glenn Headley, the United States soap queen. Freddie poses as a psychosomatically crippled veteran, who needs $50,000 to pay for the services of celebrated and fake 
Dr. Schofhausen. But a little birdie tells Jameson about Freddy's ruse, and Jameson smartly poses as the doctor. Both men pull Janet in opposite directions, trying to convince her to give them the money, while simultaneously fucking with each other. Jameson thwacks Freddy's allegedly numb legs with all his might, trying to get him to break character. Which gives us the best Steve Martin facial expressions ever. And Freddy gets a group of sailors to kidnap Jameson, trying to get him out of the game. That backfires tremendously, because it turns out Jameson was a sailor. He befriends the group, convincing them to turn on Freddy. Plans halt when Jameson discovers that Janet is not actually a soap heiress, rather that she won the title Soap Queen in a sweepstakes. She is planning to sell everything that she owns to pay for Freddy's treatment. Jameson's morals kick in, not wanting to take money from someone who doesn't have it. That's when the bet gets altered. The new bet is can Freddy sleep with Janet or not? Freddy plays with Janet's emotions in an attempt to win, acting as though his love for her has miraculously given him the ability to walk again. But Jameson predicted that this might happen, and he preemptively tricks Janet into going along with it but not actually banging Freddy. After the rendezvous, Janet shows up at Jameson's mansion, crying and saying that her and Freddy did have sex, but that he ran off afterwards and stole everything from her, including $50,000. Jameson, trying to make it up to the sympathetic Janet, tells her that he's going to cover all of her expenses, reimburse her, and put her on a plane back home. Right before boarding, the ever-sweet Janet returns the money to Jameson, saying that although she appreciates his generosity, she couldn't accept it. Just as the plane takes off, Freddy shows up announcing that Janet has stripped and robbed him. Jameson, thinking that Freddy robbed her, defends Janet. He explains that he reimbursed her for everything that Freddie stole, but that she was so wonderful that she returned the money. The two start realizing that something fishy is going on. They open up the briefcase that should be full of money and find Jameson's clothes. The ultimate con is revealed. Duped, the two return to the villa. While contemplating on a bench, a totally iconic shot from this film, they hear a rustle coming up the stairs. It's none other than Janet with a gaggle of wealthy real estate buyers. Using a fake but convincing New York City accent, Janet convinces Freddy and Jameson to play along, and the three set off to con the world. This is an ever-moving film. So much happens so quickly, and we're continuously hit with new revelations. The writing is outstanding, but given how much it pulls from the original 1964 bedtime story, I think that the credit for that may lay elsewhere. However, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is substantially funnier than Bedtime Story, because the true success of the film is Martin and Kane's performances. Not only are they outstanding independently, but even though the plot calls for them to be in competition, their acting styles never compete, which means that the audience gets not one, but two amazing leading men. Compared to Martin, Brando in Bedtime Story just feels miscast. Martin is the ideal bumbling swindler, with successful slapstick, wordplay, and character humor. Kane adds in a touch of highbrow comedy, and neither actor steals the show because they are so well matched. Peachy has decided to join us. She's woken up from her nap on my lap, and now you might be seeing a little bit of her head. The middle child of the three films, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, is also substantially funnier than 2019's The Hustle. Even though I enjoyed The Hustle more than most, I think that the gender swap where the two con men are actually con women doesn't work at all. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels was already a gender reversal because the real world stereotype is that gold digging women are out to bilk men for money. The fundamental comedic element of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is men conning women out of money. The anti-stereotype. To have con women felt more palpable and therefore less funny. Why bother flipping the script of a script that's already been flipped? Within Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, one of the advantages that Freddy has over Jameson is that I'm younger than you, I'm better looking than you, I'm thinner than you. I could kick your ass off this hill in a New York minute. How is it exactly that Wilson has any success at conning? She isn't younger than Anne Hathaway. Ooh. She isn't better looking than Anne Hathaway. Ooh. She isn't thinner than Anne Hathaway. Ooh. But I guess she could probably kick Anne Hathaway off a hill in a New York minute. So she's got one out of four of Freddy's good qualities. Check out this scene. I think I'll just have some water. I'm saving my money for something special. I am going to help my gram gram. But my grandmother is a wonderful woman. She has a laugh that can make the birds sing. <laughs> but she's been quite ill lately, and the hospital bill's a bit adding up. Compared to this one. I'll just get a glass of water, please. I have to save all my money because I'm here to find my sister. She's been taken. Taken? Like? Like, by men who sell hot white virgins to kajillionaires on yachts. Drastic, right? Who would you be more likely to give money to? When Frank Oz set out to make Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Michael Caine asked him why they were remaking a commercial flop, which bedtime story was. 
Oz responded that there would be no point in remaking a movie that was a success, which is the exact reason that The Hustle probably didn't need to be made. Let's talk about the end of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, which might be my only criticism of the film. The genius of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is in the con, and the men run flawless cons. I know that when watching this movie, a lot of people very quickly figured out that Janet was the true con artist. However, I was not one of those people. I am an idiot. This begs the question. If the ending wasn't a surprise, was the movie less of a success? If the movie didn't con you, does that make it a failure? The art of the con is the entire point, after all. Secondly, I'm not a huge fan of the three teaming up in the end and walking off into the proverbial sunset. I would have liked it better if the movie had ended right after the reveal that Janet ran off with all their money. I'm not sure if they were trying to set up a sequel by leaving us with a trifecta of crooks, but I prefer the concept of healthy competition between scammers over a gang of thieves. Criticisms aside, this movie makes me laugh out loud every time I watch it. It's a powerhouse of a comedy, and I would easily give it 6 out of 7 thumbs up. Let me know what you think about it in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I can't wait for the next one.